about the societal impact of computing. So basically, let me so, uh, be interactive. Show of hands, how many of y'all have three devices, personal? How many of y'all got four? How many of y'all got five? <laughs> like me. So, I mean, just technology has grown so much and it, it helps us in our day-to-day -day lives just so much. Um, but the, uh, uh, the amount of data that is contained in these devices are just unreal. I mean, when you think about it, I know when I was teaching the database class, we were talking about the amount of data that we produce personally as far as personal information. Every time we get on our cell phone, um, access to banking information, okay? Uh, emails, personal emails, business emails. Um, so it's just amazing how much your daily life relies on technology. It's just unreal. Um, how much of your personal information is stored either on your own smartphone, tablet, I know I do. Now I have like multiple passwords on everything, but I mean my banking information, my medical information, like, cause I know that in Hattiesburg, they have a system called Iris. I don't know if they've, they have that here, but I can basically go in and, you know, set appointments, talk to my doctors, telehealth, everything like that. So just the amount of data that goes um, through the, the atmosphere is just unreal and we really need to be aware of that, okay? Definitely be aware of it. Um, as far as the societal impact of computing, and this is just a few numbers that I found um, from the website financesonline.com, one of the most severe challenges that the modern world must deal with in the short and long term is going to be cybercrime, okay? Um, it is, I always say, unreal. Uh, the amount of monetary damage that cybercrime inflicts on a regular basis. Um, and this is just some of the numbers. Uh, $16.4 billion per day, okay? $684.9 million per hour. $11 million per minute as far as cybercrime is concerned. So that's the impact. And a lot of that um, cost is, um, is absorbed by the consumer. It, I mean, as far as you and me, you, you probably don't see it, but it, it, we absorb that. So have, well, I don't know if any of you actually have taken a look at it. Um, threat maps, threat maps. Um, what threat maps are is basically a visual representation of cyber attacks that are going on in the world at any given time. There are several companies that do threat maps. Um, if you look on, like if you Google and you go to threat maps, real-time cybersecurity, there's several different ones. There's FireEye, Kaspersky is a good one, uh, Checkpoint, Fortnite. All of these have a threat map. I actually pulled up FireEye's threat map so that we could take a look at it. All right, so this is real time, okay? Um, you see you have confirmed attacks just going all across the world, okay? Uh, these attacks are against financial services, uh, telecommunications, manufacturing services. It get, actually gives you uh, the reported industries in the past 30 days here. Um, but if you actually wanted to drill in or drill down, and again, I think this, we're just trying to cover the surface right now. We're not gonna go like, you know, my cybersecurity class will be like, ooh, come on, let's do this. Um, but I just wanted you to see this so that you could actually see um, that it is a global threat. It is a global thing, okay? These attacks are happening in real time, okay? All right, so. And you can go to any of these and just put in um, cybersecurity threat map in Google and it'll pull them up for you, okay? All right. Doo -doo -doo -doo. All right, so where are we? Okay, so 
again, I like to, for my presentations to be a little bit interactive. So we're going to actually do a little game of which countries are the top 10 countries with the most hackers in the world. There is no wrong answers. OK, we're learning here. So who, who thinks what, what's number 10? Just guessing. Australia? Uh, no. Number 10 is actually Hungary. Uh, it's the little small country, country that could. <laughs> I mean, the population is not very big. Um, the, network, the networks are actually a lot better. But um, small country, but a good and sound hacking network. Um, it actually um, edged out South Korea. South Korea. Uh, was number 10, but it got edged out by hung Hungary. Uh, Hungary has 1.4 of the global cybercrime activities that are based from Hungary. Okay. Uh, number nine, anybody want to take a guess? You would think, wouldn't you? Italy is number nine. Uh, Italy, ninth position, 1.6 of the total cybercrime activities actually come from Italy. Didn't think about that. Huh? Hmm. Most of the time when you're thinking about cyber attacks, you're thinking about uh, Eastern European countries like Poland, stuff like that. But Poland, I don't think, well, Poland might have been on the list, but we're going to figure it out. All right. So next, if you know your map, so I'm just going to you know your flags. largest, really the largest population in the world, next to China, next to China, yeah. India. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, all those robocalls that you get. <laughs> yeah. So India, let's see, India is eighth. Um, of course, it is the IT hub of the world. 2.3, 2.3% cybercrime comes from India. Mm -hmm. All right. So what's number seven? Romania. So we're back in that Eastern European country. So Romania is 2.8%. OK. All right. Now y'all should know this one. Brazil. Brazil. Uh, Brazil has been making a great comeback <laughs> as far as cybercrime is concerned. Really. A lot of the cyber crime that happens in, uh, I think it's, what is it, the Western Hemisphere, comes from Brazil. Brazil. Uh, Brazil, 3.3% of global cyber crime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, number five. It's close. You're in there. Uh, you're close. Taiwan. Taiwan. Taiwan, 3.7%. Yeah, Taiwan. Yeah. All right. Eastern European. I have to look at my little thing. The one that we're dealing with right now. Russia. Yeah, no, number four is Russia. Uh, let's see. Russian hackers are famous worldwide and have been known for attacking the most secure networks like Google. Facebook, Apple, all of these have been attacked from Russia. Okay. All right. Number three. And you wouldn't really think, but. Yeah, it's close. Turkey. Turkey, yep. A uh, large network of hackers acting in interest of the Turkish government. Uh, some of these governments, like China, has their own hacking groups um, that are government backed. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the process um, as far as state sponsored um, hacking. But Turkey actually is a actor. 4.8% comes from cybercrime comes from Turkey. Uh, number two. USA, you know, we good at something. Uh, 
<laughs> so home of the most infamous hackers, um, Anonymous, and we'll talk about the different hacker groups as well. Uh, Anonymous came from the United States or based in the United States. 10% um, of the world's attack traffic actually comes from the United States. Mm -hmm. And of course, I know y'all know what number one is. I don't even have to put the thing up there. China. China. They, they actually, as far as their education system, they start at a very young age uh, as far as their hackers come, as far as their proficiency with technology is ingrained into their culture. So that's just um, a given. Uh, let me see their number. 41%. 41% of the world's cybercrime actually comes from um, China. So, all right. So now we know where these cyber attacks are coming from. All right, so the interactive part. So let's define what is cybersecurity. Anybody have any thoughts? Like I said, there are no wrong answers. Making it more inconvenient for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Securing networks, yeah, anybody else? What is cybersecurity? Don't be shy. I know y'all ain't shy now. Really? We we shy? We all we all family in here. You know? Okay. It's all right. So what is cybersecurity? Let's define it. Cybersecurity is the application of technologies, processes, and controls to protect systems, networks, programs, devices, and data from cyber attacks. That is the definition of cybersecurity. Uh, its aims are to reduce the risk of cyber attacks and protect against the unauthorized exploitations of systems, networks, and alike. Okay. Um, Again, and I tell my students all the time, there is no silver bullet, okay? If it is connected to a network, it is an attack vector for a cyber attack, just a given. I mean, the only way that it couldn't be is if you unplug it, okay? Um, one thing, and, and there will be a quiz at the end of this, y'all got to test, y'all ain't know. I'm just playing. Um, <laughs> Um, but confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information, that's what um, security professionals, uh, that's our ultimate goal, okay, is to make sure that the confidentiality of, um, of data, integrity, and availability um, is intact, okay? And we'll talk about the CIA triad and all that a little bit when we get to that section, but sometimes I, I like to kind of get ahead of myself. I'm trying not to, but we're, we're trying. All right, so next question. What is cybercrime? So we've defined what cybersecurity is. So what is cybercrime? What is that? I'm gonna give you a moment. <laughs> Don't all just talk at once. Okay. Hacking? Oh yeah, definitely that. Definitely hacking. Okay, what else would be considered a cybercrime? Illegal breach. Illegal breach, yeah. Stealing, Stealing personal information. All of that is within the realm of cybercrime. All right, so what is cybercrime? And I have notes. All right, so cybersecurity, we already talked about that. Um, so let's define cybercrime. Cybercrime would be offenses committed to harm the reputation or cause physical or mental harm to a victim using computers or networks. Okay, so that's cybercrime. That's kind of like the high level definition of it. Um, the FBI has a wonderful um, definition of it. Um, it reads cybercrime also called computer crime, is the use of a computer as an instrument to further illegal ends such as committing fraud, stealing intellectual property and identities, or violating privacy. Okay, so all of that is within the realms of cybercrime. Um, there are organizations that focus on cybercrime. 
uh, as far as, and we've all heard about the NSA and you know CIA and stuff like that, but the one organization that focuses the most on it is FBI, okay? Um, they actually have uh, on their website wonderful information um, as far as um, cybercrime is concerned. They actually have a task force specific for cybercrime. Um, even though a lot of companies are reluctant to report cybercrimes um, because it's about reputation. A lot of times if these businesses, if it gets out that they've been hacked or they've lost data, then the reputation of that particular business just goes in the tank. So a lot of them won't report it, okay? Um, but they should because it helps as far as uh, the database that they can build from it, okay? Uh, because again, information is power. The more we know about these incidents, the more we can learn from them and we can try to um, fix the problems that exist or the vulnerabilities that exist in our systems, okay? All right, so as far as the different types of cybercrime that exist, there are uh, many and they're listed here. But the one thing that you need to understand as far as the different types of cybercrime, cybercrime falls under two main categories, okay? Um, the first category is criminal activity that targets. Then you also have criminal activity that uses computers to commit other crimes. So basically it's a, uh, for the lack of a word, a jump off <laughs> to other different crimes, okay? Um, Computer as a target crimes um, require a much higher level of expertise um, from the perpetrators, okay? Uh, given the technical expertise required to execute these types of crimes, are, um, these are the ones that society just usually doesn't see um, on a regular basis, okay? Um, these crimes usually depend on viruses, malware, um, your DOS attacks or your denial of service attacks. Um, are usually the ones that um, they're talking about as far as computers as a target, okay? Um, as far as computer as a tool, um, those are the ones that we're more aware of as far as societal. Um, so more common to see this um, as far as different threats, um, thefts, um, scams, harassments, all those things, um, using a computer as a tool okay, to, um, to perpetrate these crimes. Um, so some of these are email, internet fraud, of course, um, theft of financial or PPI, not PPI, PII, personal identifiable information, PII. Um, extortion, your ransomware attacks, okay, that's all within that. Um, also crypto jacking, uh, where hackers mine cryptocurrency using resources that they do not own. Um, basically, they um, use your computing power to actually mine crypto, okay? Um, and then also you have cyber espionage, um, but that's when we'll talk about the different hacker types, and those type of things, okay? All right, so, all right, so we've talked about what cybercrime is. Well, we talked about what cybersecurity is. We defined that. Uh, we also define what cybercrime is. So who are the cyber criminals? Okay, let's define those as well. All right, so there are several. Uh, you have recreational. You also have script kitties. I think we've all heard of those script, script kitties, but we'll define them, okay? Uh, hacktivists, okay? Uh, also state-sponsored. Okay, what, what is state sponsored? We'll define that as well. Organized crime is a big deal, all right? Insiders, okay? Sometimes your own employees are your worst enemy, okay? Um, cyber terrorists, okay? And then lastly, we'll talk about hackers and the different types of hackers. There are several different types, okay? All right, so let's talk about recreational first, all right? so. Recreational, uh, let me make sure I get on my thing. All right, so the main motive behind your recreational hackers is fame and nor notor notoriety, notoriety. They really don't have an advanced skill set. They probably don't know how to code 
or anything like that, but they know how to access different tools to actually exploit a system, okay? Uh, one of the tools that we learn and talk about um, in our classes is Kali Linux. How many of y'all ever heard of Kali Linux? You, uh, oh, <laughs> you've been to the dark side a little bit. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they just know how to use specific tools to actually do the things that they, um, or breach a system or deface a website, different things like that. Okay, all right. Um, you also have script kitties, um, which are amateurs, but a little bit more advanced than your recreational, okay? Um, over time, they may gain experience, even become professional hackers, they might move to those next levels, okay, over time, okay? All right, um, where am I at, 17? Oh, no, we're still there. All right, so script kitties. All right, um, all right, so let's talk about hacktivists, all right? Uh, der derived from combining words hack and activism. Uh, hacktivism is the act of hacking or breaking into a computer system for political or socially motivated purposes. A uh, hacktivist performs malicious and fraudulent tasks to promote a political agenda. So that's the main thing to take away or kind of put in your mind um, as far as hacktivists is that it's political, okay? Um, they're usually trying to fight for a cause, for justice, different things like that. They're not really um, after the monetary um, gains that can be um, acquired from hacking, okay? Um, some of the most notorious hacktivist groups um, that are out there, some of these you probably don't know or have never heard of, but definitely Anonymous, you've all heard of Anonymous, right? No? Oh my God, oh, I'm, anyway. <laughs> um, I was, that was one of the main ones that, um, or uh, groups that just kind of just caught my attention um, when I first started this kind of journey about security and trying to learn more. Um, anonymous was the big deal, the really big deal. But some of the other ones, uh, you have the Cult of the Dead Cow, 1984, like for real. Um, credited with coining the phrase hacktivism in 1996, okay? Um, you also have, um, well, we have Anonymous, which is in 2003. Um, hacktivist group that grow, grew out of an online message board called 4chan. Um, back in the history of computing. <laughs> um, that was in 2003. Uh, we all know, well, WikiLeaks is another um, hacktivist group. Uh, Julian Assange, um, you can Google that name. Uh, he actually um, uh, created this particular group. Um, I forgot exactly what, it was something military that he put out online. Um, or some documents that he put out online. I think he's still on the run, I think. I think he's, they're trying to extradite him from like Switzerland or something like that, but he's fighting it tooth and nail, but that's the group that he actually created. Um, an offshoot from Anonymous is LoonSec. Um, it was established in 2011. Um, let me see anything interesting from LoonSec. Yeah, basically it came from Anonymous. Um, and then also you have a French hacktivist group, which is uh, DKD, whatever that little, the little lines, pipe, pipe, whatever. It looks like another D, but it's not. Um, a French hacktivist group um, does a lot of website defacing. It actually did the U.S. Navy site. Okay, you can kind of think about how hard that would be actually to do, is to deface a governmental site, but they actually did it. Okay. Um, and then also you have the Syrian Electronic Army, uh, which kind of goes into that hacktivist but state-sponsored kind of deal. Um, but it was actually established in 2011 to protect Syria and its president, okay? Um, when I think about Syri the Syrian Electronic Army, I think about um, China's Red Army. I forgot the name of it. It's right down the tip of my brain. I have so much stuff swimming, swimming in my brain, it's unreal. Um, you could just imagine PhD student plus this, plus that, plus this. I do everything. Okay, I'm Swiss Army knife. All right, um, all right, another type of hacking 
or hacker is your state sponsored, um, political or military in origin, uh, unlimited resources because again, you're getting, um, you're backed by a government, okay? Uh, so like China has one, Israel has one. There are several uh, countries that actually have their own hacking groups, okay? Um, one term, and we'll break this out, um, advanced persistent threats, okay? When you're thinking about state-sponsored actors, you're thinking about APTs, okay? So APTs are used to describe an attack campaign which is persistent, it's constant. It's actually a cycle that they actually create through. Um, if you look online, you can see MITRE attack. Um, that is kind of like a, a framework that hackers use, um, is MITRE attack. But it establishes a long-term presence on a network in order to mine sensitive data, okay? And this is the, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but another, another methodology is, and it's Lockheed Martin that has it, the kill chain. Lockheed Martin has one, and it's, it's, a, it's really interesting once you kind of deep dive and look into it um, as far as the methodology, um, as far as cyber attacks goes, okay? All right, so we talked about advanced persistence threat, and, oh, you know what? Oh, well, we're not done yet, okay. I told you I get ahead of myself all the time. All right, so organized crime. So what is organized crime? So criminal organizations that participate in cybercrime offer services that aid in the commission of crimes and cybercrime. These organizations hire hackers, programmers, and other tech bandits who combine their skills and resources to commit major crimes, okay? Um, first thing that comes into mind when I think of organized crime is the dark web. Okay, has anybody visited the dark web? <laughs> Probably no. Okay, you gotta see it, it's, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think when I think of the dark web and then I also think about Silk Road. Um, Tor. Yeah, that Tor browser, you gotta have it. <laughs> huh? I've heard of that. Uh, oh, Tor? Mm -hmm. Or yeah, Tor browsers? Yeah, 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 it's awesome. <laughs> Not that I know about any of those things. Huh? Bitcoin? Oh, BitTorrent? Nah, I can't talk about that. <laughs> I'm on the clock. Get me afterwards, we'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, a lot of times I think about, um, I think about those type of things um, when we're talking about organized crime. Um, now, there are some organized crime gangs that are kind of notorious, okay? Um, I actually just pulled out five of them uh, first one up is the Cobalt Cyber Game, okay? Um, Cobalt um, malware attacks, uh, which attacked 100 financial firms in more than 40 countries around the globe. Um, these thieves were able to plunder over $11 million in every heist, thanks to sophisticated cyber, cyber crime tar um, campaigns targeting multiple banks, okay? So that is Cobalt. Uh, you also have Dark Side. We all have heard of Dark Side. I think they mentioned it in um, the presentation at first with uh, Nightline. Uh, Dark Side responsible for the Colonial Pipeline attack. Uh, Dark Side business strategy is to provide ransomware services um, that they supply on the dark web. Okay. Um, you also have Magcart, uh, Magcart Syndicate. Uh, it's a large e-commerce hacking ring, uh, which made up of various gangs operating under a single umbrella, uh, collecting uh, customer and credit card information. So they basically um, concentrate on PII, or personal uh, information, or credit card information, those type of things, okay? Uh, you also have Evil Corp. That is really a thing. Okay, you think about cartoons and Evil Corp. No, there is really an Evil Corp out there. <laughs> All right, Evil Corp has been associated with a series of new assaults against small and medium-sized businesses in the United States in 2020. Um, also involves Semitech. Um, they actually have, there was a plot to target through Semitech um, 
uh, through Semitech, uh, different firms as far as with malware is concerned, okay? Um, so they were using that as a back door to get in, okay? So if, evil cork is a thing, um, based in Russia, of course, okay? And then you have re-evil, okay? Re-evil is a thing, all right? So re-evil um, hacked Quanta Computer. You've probably never heard of Quanta Computer, but Apple computers are assembled through Quanta in Taiwan. So you could think if they were able to access Quanta, they could access iPhone's firmware and ship out malware already prepackaged. Okay, so you have to be careful. Okay, all right. I know there's a whole bunch of Apple fans in here. I know a whole bunch of iPhones floating around. Yeah, I know, I know. All right, so those are just the top five. Okay, as far as uh, cybercrime gangs are concerned. All right. Um, all right, another hacker um, uh, type is insiders. Okay, these are the employees within the company itself. Okay, usually they're dissatisfied, disgruntled, um, and usually they, they become hackers um, through that. Um, disgruntledness, okay? Uh, when I think about insiders, I think about logic bombs, uh, which a logic bomb is basically a piece of programming where um, if a certain event happens, like say if you get fired, then it interacts that logic bomb and it basically destroys all the data on those hard drives, okay? So that's what I think about when I think about insiders, okay? All right, um, you also have cyber terrorists, okay? So cyber terrorists, of course, use network tools and attacks to shut down critical na national infrastructures, okay? Um, to coerce or intimidate a government or civ civilian population, okay? Um, an incident, in, and I, do, I know I can't prove it, I can't prove it, but I always put some of my, you remember the Super Bowl when it was in New Orleans? You remember when the power went out for like about an hour? I just knew it. I knew that somebody hacked that system. <laughs> and that's what happened, but I could be wrong. But I think about that. So um, you think about like fire sales, and I don't know. Okay. Okay, how, how many of y'all are Bruce Willis fans? Okay. The, and I forget, I think it's uh, Die Hard, Live Free or Die Hard where they had a cyber attack and it was called a fire sale where basically the, everybody panicked and chaos ensued. They was basically anarchists, but again, that's what I think about when I think of stuff like that. I'm just, my mind races. Um, but basically they use it to intimidate government or civilian populations to co coerce them uh, for um, either political or financial gains. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about cyber terrorists, okay? All right, and then you also have your plain Jane. <laughs> I don't know how plain it is, but you have just your regular hackers. Um, they have incredible technical skills, uh, able to breach any network, uh, just like they were talking about in um, uh, the piece earlier, basically, there's nothing to stop people like this. It's basically they can get in whenever they want to, okay? Um, they basically study the vulnerabilities of a system or a network, and that's where you'll see um, penetration testers come from these hackers, okay? Um, with these types, there's different hats, okay? Uh, you have black hats. Uh, black hats go out of their way to discover vulnerabilities in systems, um, and they exploit those um, vulnerabilities, okay? Usually for financial gain or malicious purposes. Um, anybody heard of the Black Hat Conference that they have in D.C. every year? That's where a lot of your talent comes from. <laughs> Especially, you'll see like government agencies like um, uh, NSA Big One, that'll be there, they'll have a booth set up because basically they're trying to get this talent to work for them, okay? Um, you'll see, and it, this is kind of a one-off story. Sometimes I have stories. Um, I had a student that actually um, 
broke into the school system in, I think, don't make me quote, I'm probably just throwing out something, but I think it might have been in Oklahoma or something. He broke in, they caught him, he went to jail. Then after he did, I think he might have did like three years, he got out, he started working for the government. So that's just the pipeline. That's what they do. They'll go break something, mess something up, and then the next thing you'll know, they're working for the government because they're looking for that type of talent. Because it is a talent, you know, to be able to um, find vulnerabilities. And a lot of these students, they create code. A lot of these exploits you'll see come from this, this, um, this group of students. Mm -hmm. Um, you also have gray hats that kind of like, eh, do I do, do I don't? Am I going to break something today? Am I not going to break something today? Am I going to tell them that there's something wrong with this? You know, they kind of like, they like, and eh, they kind of like in between, okay? Um, <laughs> they violate standards and principles, but without intending to do harm or gain um, financial gain, okay? Um, kind of like bug bounties. Um, Google has a lot of bug bounties where they, um, they want people to actually find the flaws in the code and then report them. And sometimes they'll pay them for it. So, so yeah, that's what that is. And then, you, of course, you have your white hat hackers, um, quote unquote, ethical hackers. OK, um, when I think about ethical hacking, I think about EC Council. Um, they're one of the, the best training programs as far as ethical hacking is concerned. Um, basically, they do a lot of pen testing or penetration testing, uh, which is a, a burgeoning field, <laughs> a very lucrative field, too, um, if you can get into it. But a lot of your ex-military actually kind of goes into the pen testing field um, because they just have that kind of infiltration, but also the technical side of it, too, so they can merge those two worlds together. So. Then, so then you have your ethical hackers. All right. So I need a break. I need to stop talking. <laughs> so this is the portion of the show when you actually do a little testing. OK, so we're going to go over it. So let's make sure that you guys were paying attention, that I wasn't just, you know, talking to hear myself talk. <laughs> and we'll go over it. All right, let's go ahead and answer these. So who has number one, hacktivist? Which one is number one? F. F, okay, performs malicious and fraudulent tasks to promote a political agenda. That's right. All right, so number two, recreational, which is that one? G. G? All right, the main motive is fame and notoriety. notoriety. So that's number two. All right, script kitties, number three, which is that one? C. C? Okay, amateurs learn from the internet, use available tools to crack a system. All right. So number four, state sponsored, which one is that one? D. All right, political or military origin. All right, number five, organized crime. Which one? H, all right, groups of hacker programming, tech bandits, all right. All right, number six, insiders. Which one? E, all right, come from within the organization, of course. All right, number seven, cyber terrorists. Which one? A, did somebody say A? All right, uses network tools, shut down critical national infrastructures, all right? And last one, eight hackers, which one's left? B? All right, all right. And, and trust me, if you, 
anything wrong, it's okay. I promise you, I'm not gonna fail you. You know, I don't fail students, not just like, <laughs> I fail them all the time, I promise you I do. No, I don't. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about social engineering. So what is social engineering? Just throw anything out there. I mean, we're talking here. We're just, you know, what is social engineering? I mean, we've heard about it. So what is it? And, you know, in your words. Interacting? Yeah. When I think about it, the first thing I think about is trickery. Trickeration. Is trickeration a word? <laughs> I think I might just have made that up. <laughs> Trickeration. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Definitely. Fa deep fakes. Deep fakes. Has anybody seen the Tom Cruise deep fake? Yeah. Did you see the latest one? Dude, like, and uh, what's his name? Um, Peel, Key and Peel. Yeah. He actually came behind guy, and I mean, it looked so seamless, but it was fake. It looked like it was really Tom Cruise. Look, look up deep fake and Tom Cruise. It will blow your mind. It will blow your mind. But yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Like, you know, fakeration. <laughs> fakeration, I'm making words up today. All right, so social engineering. So let's define social engineering. Social engineering is the act of exploiting human weaknesses to gain access to personal information and protected systems. Okay, so that is social engineering. Uh, it's used for a broad range of malicious activities uh, through human interactions, uh, use psychological manipulation to trick users into making security mistakes and giving away sensitive information. So that is social engineering. Um, there are some great books, if you're a reader like me, I can't help it, I just read a lot. Um, the Art of Deception is a great book. Um, and then there's another one uh, called Dark Psychology. When you get into like the, to the human mind, oh my God, it's like, it's like awesome. Um, but those are some good books as far as um, uh, social engineering, okay? Basically, we're just manipulating a person to do, and then a lot of times when we're doing these things, it's just human nature. Like, and it's a Southern thing too. Southerners are extremely helpful. <laughs> extremely helpful. Like, you'll just ask them like, sure, baby, I know that girl. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll answer questions freely because that's our nature is just to be helpful. It is, it is. Um, Northerners, not so much. <laughs> All right, so how does social engineering work, okay? Um, what makes social engineering especially dangerous is that it relies on human error rather than vulnerabilities in software and operating systems. So, and I've heard this said before, um, why go through the trouble of breaking into a system when I can just ask you for it? Why, because skip the middle man, <laughs> just ask you for it. Okay, um, social engineer, engineers ma manipulate human feelings, such as curiosity, fear, to carry out schemes and draw victims into their traps. Okay, therefore, be weary whether um, be weary whenever you feel alarmed by something. If they're trying to force you to do something, a, a sense of urgency, you know, they oh, you need to do this right now. No, I don't. I'm, why, <laughs> you know? And that's what they, 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 they pick up on that, that fear, you know? So always, always question. If you're like me, I question everything. I ask questions, but like, why? You want me to do what? Okay, why you want me to do that? <laughs> so be a little bit, uh, and I know for Southerners, it's their na our nature, but sometimes you have to um, kind of ask yourself certain questions about things, okay? All right. All right. Um, so as far as the attack cycle, we definitely need to talk about this as far as social engineering is concerned. Um, 
the first thing that a social engineer is going to do is prepare um, by gathering background information on you, okay? Um, also, after they gathered that background information, um, as far as you'll hear it called footprinting, kind of, um, then we infiltrate. We'll establish a relationship um, or initiate an interaction, um, building trust between your uh, the person you're attacking and the social engineer. Um, then we'll exploit it, exploit that information. We'll get that information, okay? And then we'll disengage, we'll, you know, um, back up, okay? So that is kind of like the attack cycle for social engineering, all right? All right, so when we're talking about social engineering, there are different threats that are out there, okay? Uh, the first three, um, is going to be more physical in nature, okay? Where the last three are more network, you know, computer network attacks, okay? Um, but we will go through each one of them individually so that we can have a good idea. Um, but first, let's define the difference between physical security and network security. So what is physical security? All right. Physical security is the protection of people, property and physical assets from actions and events that could cause damage or loss. OK, uh, physical security protects cybersecurity by limiting who has access to spaces where data is stored. OK, so that's basically locked doors. OK, server rooms always locked. Um, a lot of times they have combination locks. Um, one thing that I found and I always find interesting is hospitals. Um, <laughs> a lot of times they'll label like network doors where they really don't need to. I mean, why are you going to advertise the fact that this is my network closet? OK. Um, another thing is like just um, nurses stations is a big deal, um, especially late at night when you might have nurses that are on rounds and nobody's in the nursing station, if the door is not locked or if the systems aren't locked down, then anybody with any kind of, you know, IT knowledge could go in and do whatever, okay? Um, I remember when I was in Jackson at, um, uh, I think it was St. Dominic's, I was seeing a friend, it was late at night and I was just kind of wandering the halls a little bit and I saw a desktop and I looked at it and I was like, huh? And I went, doo -doo. came straight up. I said, really? I said, okay. I backed up and I was like, oh no, I'm not gonna go to jail for this one. Um, but yeah, it's things like that as far as physical security is concerned. Um, people don't get a security system for their home until they get broken into. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, same premise. Same principle, okay? Um, basically, uh, you, you lock the door after the cow's gone ahead and went moo. <laughs> uh, but that's the principle. Um, uh, physical security, when we're talking about physical security, we're talking about locked doors, uh, combination locks, um, uh, biometric scanners, uh, if you can. I know it gets a little bit pricey when we're talking about like biometrics, you know, fingerprints or, uh, retinal scans, different things like that. Um, but the, all of that is within the realm of physical security, okay? Um, what is network security? All right, so when we're talking about network security, a uh, set of rules and configurations designed to protect the CIA triad. All right, so what is the CIA triad? So the CIA triad, and this isn't the, you know, the CIA, like the FBI. <laughs> but what we're talking about in relationship to security, we're talking about confidentiality. Confidentiality refers to an organization's efforts to keep its data private or secret. So that's confidentiality. Um, a lot of times you'll hear like different classifications as far as secret, top secret, private. okay? Um, we also have integrity refers to the quality of something being whole or complete. Uh, so no missing information, and then also availability, uh, which means that network systems and applications are up and running, okay? So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the CIA triad, okay? 
Um, and that's just one of the basis, basis, is, basis uh, of network security, all right? Um, these technologies include your firewalls, your VPNs, and also your IPSs or your intrusion prevention uh, systems are all within that, okay? So you have your physical security, which is your locked doors, and then you also have your network security, which is gonna be your firewalls that actually help um, to um, lessen intrusion and um, uh, traffic, okay? All right, so we've defined those two, all right? So the art of dumpster diving, and it is an art, it really is. <laughs> um, actually, when I was at UAB, we actually did like an exercise on dumpster diving. Basically, they would give you a trash can full of information and you had to actually decipher what you could get out of it. Uh, whether it be old manuals, uh, passwords that could have been jotted down, different things like that. So it was a great exercise. Um, but as far as dump dumpster diving is concerned, it's a technique used to retrieve information that could be used to carry out an attack on a computer system. Uh, dumpster diving isn't limited to searching through trash for access codes or passwords written on sticky notes. Um, you could have innocent information such as a phone list. Phone list is golden, okay? Because uh, you can do a lot of impersonation from a phone list. Once you figure out how the organization does its email structure, if you have a phone list, you can, you can kind of um, put that in and then you can send emails to basically everybody and anybody in the organization just off of a phone list. So one of the major ways to defend against something as far as dumpster diving is owning a shredder. Shred everything. I have a personal shredder at home. Anytime I get mail that has any kind of personal information on it, bzzz, I even got my wife into the habit of it. It's just bzzz, okay. And then plus it's kind of like, you know those little things like packing little things with the little the dots where you just like, the little poppets. <laughs> Shredding is just the same thing. It's so satisfying. You really have to try it. Um, but shredding is one of the, the big ways to do that. But as far as from an organizational standpoint, shredding and actually having a removal um, or disposal policy of information, whether it be hard drives, you know, um, a lot of times with hard drives, they'll tell you to drill a hole in them or something like that as far as disposing them. Um, there's another thing called degaussing where you can kind of go over um, the hard drives um, to actually try to wipe all that information off. Um, but even when you do that, you can still have sectors within those hard drives or those platters that will have data on them. So that's one of the reasons why they say to drill holes in them and just totally destroy them, okay? A previous company that I worked for, they actually like had like periodically, they would go ahead and do it. Uh, with some sledge sledgehammers, they would like get some frustration out <laughs> um, by doing stuff like that. But but yeah, definitely you want to um, be mindful of how you dispo dispose um, of information as far as financial reports, company policies. All of these are just information that a penetration tester or a hacker can use to infiltrate your organization. Okay. Um, another thing, um, and this is again in the realm of physical security, is shoulder surfing, okay? Uh, shoulder surfing is using direct observation techniques, basically looking over somebody's shoulder. Um, a lot of times you'll see this done in crowded um, situations. Um, it's kind of hard if it's just, you know, one-on-one -on -one and you see somebody just looking behind you like, what are you doing? Um, but if, in a, if it, in a crowding situation, be mindful of that. Um, I know if you're like me, you're just always aware of where you are and who is looking at you. Um, like at ATM machines, different things like that. And that's why a lot of bigger cities and larger cities, um, they put you in that, that box. I forgot what it's called. Um, when you put in your card or your code and then the door slams behind you and then you're in there by yourself and no one can actually see your code and everything like that, you'll see that in large metropolitan areas. Um, 
But again, what we're trying to glean from shoulder surfing is passwords, pin numbers, those types of things. Um, so definitely we need to be aware um, of your surroundings and who's around you uh, when you're putting in those codes. Um, also have piggybacking. Um, I remember a company that I worked for where we had um, card readers and that was one of the main things they always told you don't let anybody come in behind you like after you swipe your card you go in nobody else come behind you um, because you just you never know um, I was reading um, no I wasn't reading it was a podcast and they were talking about they were doing a penetration test and basically what the guy did was um, they had a smoker's pit outside of the, the, the building and he just hung out outside in the, in the smokers section and he had um, he basically had like a um, RFID reader or scanner on him and basically he walked up to one of the employees and was like yeah we're doing a test on such such so so man you know we're trying to get this fixed so you guys want to have a problem um, getting in and outside of the building can I just see your car real quick so we can try to fix it yeah man I got you gave him the card scanned it got the information off of it, cloned the card, keys to the city. So again, <laughs> piggybacking is a big deal. Um, and that more goes into, you know, um, penetration testing, but um, it just puts you in that mind of that. Um, uh, basically what people do is they kind of watch personnel, okay? And kind of, and this, this all is within the, the realm of social engineering. Okay, being aware of your surroundings and making sure that you, people don't basically tailgate you or get into a building or an, access, access, an unauthorized area um, off of you. Okay, so be careful about that as well. All right, phishing attacks. Let's talk about phishing. Um, we've all talked about phishing or kind of seen phishing before. Uh, we all get all those emails from that um, that prince in Africa um, <laughs> that's saying that, you know, you, you send me a hundred thousand dollars, you send me a hundred dollars, I send you ten thousand dollars and you feed my family or something. Um, <laughs> but we've all got those messages or emails, okay? Um, in a phishing attack, um, basically you should think of the fish as a F, as phishing, because basically they're trying to bait you to do something that they want you to do, okay? Whether it is uh, d download an attachment or anything that might have some kind of malicious code in it, okay? Um, targeted phishing is called spear phishing, okay? Usually you'll see this done um, upper level management. They'll do spear phishing. Um, another thing, um, and I don't have it on the slide, is whaling is another um, term as far as um, where you're actually targeting a specific person, whaling, you're trying to get the big fish, okay? Whether it be a CEO, CFO, whatever, you're trying to get access to them, okay? Uh, variance of this um, is called vishing, uh, is where you actually at using video, um, and then you also have smishing. <laughs> Uh, is where it's like SS, S, SMS messaging, um, like text messages and different things like that. Um, and I get those sometimes too, where they'll send me like a little text message and you won't recognize the phone number or anything like that. And first thing I do, delete, delete, delete. I don't trust none of y'all. Delete, delete. Um, so yeah, phishing attacks you definitely need to be um, aware of and be weary of. Um, Usually when you get these emails or phishing emails, the first thing that I look at is that header. It's the first thing I look at. If that header looks a little bit weird and off, you know, or the spelling might be off, okay? Because again, the whole content of the email will, looks official, but if you look at that header, or a lot of times you can hover over that header, you'll see where it's actually really coming from, okay? All right. Um, also, that SM, uh, SMS uh, message, 
Um, basically, they want you to reply yes or something like that, or they'll give you a link to something um, where you, you know, download something or inject something into your phone, and then they own that phone. Basically, they can use it for anything as a jump off point for a botnet, all kinds of different things can happen, okay? So, as far as ransomware is concerned, uh, ransomware has become a considerable problem. Um, you've probably seen a lot of the high profile attacks like the one that they talked about in uh, the first video where they were talking about, you know, um, Colonial Pipeline, uh, JBS was another one as far as the meat packing plant. Uh, those are some other uh, high profiles. Um, another, a few of them that I've seen that they've really kind of ramped up on is hospitals uh, because you have a lot of patient information um, that they need to protect. Um, I think I've seen some ransomware attacks, um, trying to think of the exact um, situations, but I mean, you could Google them. Mm, I think, yeah, Equifax, that's what you're talking about, but I don't think that was a ransomware attack. I think that was a, just a malware where they actually infiltrated into the, to the, the system and just pulled out all kinds of uh, information. I think that was like, how long ago was that? Like five years ago? Three years? Yeah, that was a big one. Um, the first big one that I remember that I actually studied was Target. When Target had their big um, uh, security breach and you will never, well, who, you think, who do you think was the cause of that breach as far as the Target breach? Kinda. Kinda. Uh-uh. It was a third party. It was the HVAC system. They actually went through, they had, you know how a lot of your computer networks, they'll have like um, a guest account, you know, like you guys have a guest account. Um, a lot of those vendors were accessing the system through that account and Basically, people got a hold to it, got the passwords, and then the next thing you know, they use that to get into the, PL, the POS systems, and basically all that data got exfiltrated. Yeah, I remember that one. That was, that was very interesting. Um, but yeah, ransomware has just become more and more of a problem. Um, a lot of times, they will um, do the ran, I mean, they'll, uh, lock down the systems with the ransomware, and they'll pay the ransom, but sometimes they still, they won't open the files, okay? So it's, it's kind of a, a iffy kind of situation when you're dealing with uh, ransomware um, and these types of criminals, okay? So definitely be weary. Um, the Colonial Pipeline, does anybody remember the specifics of that pipeline? I know it's up there on the screen, but, um, but yeah, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. Um, they actually paid how much? 4.4 million as far as the ransom is concerned. Um, May 7th, um, the attack computing system that managed that particular pipeline, so halted the operations, okay? Um, Dark Side was actually um, behind that particular attack, okay? So this is just something that could possibly happen to a system. I mean, even your personal systems, um, if you're not careful, you can actually have ransomware attack your personal system, okay? Um, I think I had an administrator at the college that I was working at before. Uh, she called me and was like, Terry, I think something's wrong with my system. Uh, so I did a little investigation. She thought it was ransomware, but actually it wasn't. But um, again, uh, it's not something to play with, okay? Definitely be aware of it. All right, imposter scams. I love my little bunnies. Aren't they cute? They're cute. Um, has anybody heard of the Zelle situation, the banking app, Zelle? No? Ha-ha. All right, so I got a little something for you. All right. 
consumers are getting duped by fraudsters impersonating banks, urging them to send money through Zelle, the mobile payment method embedded in many banking apps. Hey, Georgia, there have been about 70,000 complaints to the FTC. Payment apps claiming more than $130 million in losses. Scammers are using phone calls and text messages posing as legitimate banks like Bank of America, Chase, and Wells Fargo. And now consumer advocates are calling for action. It was devastating. Special education teacher Kylie Watson worked for months to save for her maternity leave. Then, the Pennsylvania mom received these concerning texts claiming to be from Wells Fargo. They asked me if I had authorized $3,500. Watson says she only answered the follow-up phone calls after searching online and finding the number calling her seemed to be from Wells Fargo. He wanted me to log into my Wells Fargo banking app, click on Zelle, and then I saw two transactions and the money was gone. I didn't authorize anything. Zelle is a mobile payment transfer service embedded in your banking app that allows you to send money to people directly between bank accounts. Watson's claim for a refund was denied. $3,500. That's for our mortgage, that's for groceries. ABC stations across the country reporting on customers saying they've lost thousands through their Zelle accounts from fake bank texts and phone calls claiming to be from Wells Fargo. It's just scary. It's Cynthia Marin telling San Francisco seven on your side she lost $1,700. The money's gone. This Wells Fargo customer telling Charlotte, North Carolina's Action 9's I-Team she lost $3,500. It's a savings. Federal Regulation E was put in place to protect consumers using electronic fund transfer services like Zelle from fraud, including unauthorized payments. One of the reasons that Zelle is being abused by scammers uh, is that they are taking advantage of a loophole in Reg E about what is an authorized payment versus what is an unauthorized payment. And since it appears that these fraudulent transactions were authorized by consumers, the banks are not liable. The fraudster can uh, convince you to send the money willingly, even if it's for, for, through fraudulent means, then you are not protected. That transaction is considered authorized under current federal regulation. The National Consumers League says the regulation needs to change. We think it's time to fix this loophole. The evidence is clear that millions of consumers uh, are at risk. After the ABC stations and GMA contacted Wells Fargo, these customers say they received full refunds. The company telling GMA, we are actively working to raise awareness of common scams. When a customer files a claim, we follow the applicable laws and regulatory guidance, including Regulation E, based on the facts of their situation. And again, awareness is so important here. This often starts with a text that looks like a fraud alert from your bank. It is followed by a call that looks like it legitimately came from your bank. Zelle and Wells Fargo are trying to increase awareness of these scams on their websites and social media. Wells Fargo also told us what other banks have said. It won't ask customers to transfer funds between accounts or share sensitive information. And the bottom line here is do not reply to texts or calls to you. Instead, look at your credit card, look up your bank's number on their website, call them directly, guys. That last bit of advice is yeah. so key. Yes. Unfortunately, now they're just better at this than ever and before. It looks so legit. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Be That's careful. Hard part. Yeah. So how many of you guys even knew about that one? I, I just saw that this morning as far as with Zelle, yeah. Which I've never used Zelle. I've kind of stared away from it, but it's, it's available, especially I know what regions they actually work with it. But um, the Federal Trade Commission filed nearly 500,000 complaints about imposter scams last year, okay? Uh, imposter scams lie about the identity they pose as someone else that you know or incline to trust, like your bank, per se, okay? Um, scammer pretends to be someone um, they may claim that they are affiliated with the bank um, or Amazon, okay, or Apple or whatever, or the IRS or the Social Security or Im administration, um, even a charitable organization. So if you, um, you know, give money to a charity, kind of be leery of if you get a phone call, 
okay? Definitely be leery of that, all right? All right, um, again, one of the first things that I always look at is that tag, is that header. First thing I always look at, you know, see where it's actually coming from, you know, because it can say Bank America, but it's coming from CRVDIGI at Comcast, okay? Uh, so that's the first thing. All right, and then also look at the link, okay? Actually, when you hover over the link itself, it'll show you exactly where it's really going to, okay? So that's just a couple tricks or tips uh, that you need to be in, you know, kind of aware of um, when you're looking at these uh, scammers, okay? All right, so quick quiz. I told you I got, I got to interact with you a little bit. All right, so first question. Which social engineering threats that we discussed are physical in nature. Dumpster diving is one. Which one? Shoulder surfing and piggybacking, tailgating. Yeah, those are the three. All right. It's like, oh my God, I was paying attention. <laughs> All right. So, which social engineering threats we discussed are network based? Yeah, correct, correct. All right, so what is the CIA triad in cybersecurity? You can just tell me what they stand for. We'll go with that. Availability, yes, yes. All right, what is the best way to defend against dumpster diving? Shredding. Shredding. <laughs> Shred them bad boys. And then, it, plus, it's a great feeling. It's like a release. <laughs> when you shred. Um, also, what two phishing attacks are targeted against cell phones? Smishing and vishing. All right, so those are the attacks. Okay, so we're, we're doing good. We're doing good. We're learning, people. We're learning. All right, so don't be a victim. When you receive an urgent request for help, um, call them. Verify it, okay? Verify that the person is who you think they are, okay? Always resist pressure, okay? If they're pushing you to do something, always say, why? <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind, why? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely resist that pressure. I mean, always, like, you know, just verify, you know? I don't, I don't care what you think you know. I'm going to verify it. I'm just, just be suspicious. You know, I hate that we have to, you know, be like that, but nowadays you really have to be like that. You really do. Um, definitely don't send any money. If they want to do a wire transfer, uh, they want you to do Western Union or get a money order or something like that, uh, no go. No go. Okay. All right. Um, social engineering tips to remember. All right. Slow down. Okay. There's no rush. Take your time. Okay. Research the facts. Be suspicious of any unsolicited messages. If you don't know them, then don't trust them. <laughs> I hate to say it like that, but it's true. Um, don't let a link be in control of where you land. Stay in control by finding the website yourself, uh, using the search engine of your choice, um, but don't let anybody steer you in a direction. Okay? You steer your own path, okay? Uh, e email hacking or hijacking is rampant. Um, social engineering, taking control of a person's uh, email accounts, Facebook accounts. Uh, this is happening, all, oh God, all the time. I know friends of mine, uh, their Facebook accounts have been hacked, you know, considerably. I mean, almost half <laughs> of mine have been uh, hacked, so definitely be uh, mindful of that. Um, beware of any download. If you don't know the sender personally and expect a file from them, downloading anything is a mistake. Even if you know them, call them, be sure that it's valid. Okay? All right. 
foreign offers our faith. <laughs> All right, if it is that African prince that says, you know, send me a hundred dollars and I send you a million dollars in rupees or whatever, um, nine times out of ten is fake. You know that old adage, sometimes it's too good to be true? It usually is. It usually is. All right. All right, so passwords, big deal. Um, I know we probably all have different passwords for, okay, hopefully we all have different passwords for different accounts, right? Me neither, I can't say. I just, <laughs> now I do, it's hard to remember all those passwords, it really is, um, but I try to build complexity into my passwords so that you know, I have some kind of strength to it. Um, so, of course, don't use birthdays, um, relatable names, private names, no pets, no children, don't use that. Um, the characteristics of a strong password, um, here at least eight characters, at least. I use 16. I double up. I just do, okay? Um, always use uppercase and lowercase, all right? Um, a mixture of letters, numbers, special characters is always good to put in the mix. There is a, um, an application that you can actually go online uh, where you can actually check the strength of your passwords. So you can put it in and just see like how long it would take um, a hacker to actually break the password. Um, I had a few that took like 800 and something odd years to actually do because the complexity that you build into them. So, um, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, but definitely make sure that you build some kind of complexity in your passwords. It's kind of like your first line of defense is going to be your password to it. Okay. Um, encryption, encryption of data. Um, again, I think I might have said this when we, when we first started, um, you could do a whole class on encryption and different encryption uh, standards and different ciphers uh, that exist out there. Um, all that encryption is is the conversion of data from a, a readable format to an encoded format. Um, you have like asymmetric encryption. Uh, you have symmetric encryption. Uh, there's got, again, again, you could do a whole class on it, but we just wanted to touch on it. Um, basically, encryption is a building block for, um, for data security. You want to um, put some kind of um, difficulty between the hackers and the data, okay? And the way you do that is to actually add an encryption standard um, into it to change that um, plain text into cipher text. Okay, there are some tools out there. I know with Windows, they have BitLocker uh, where you can encrypt a whole hard drive with it. Um, and that's a good product as far as from an enterprise standpoint. Um, but it depends on the version of Windows that you're working with that you have that particular um, um, uh, capability. Um, another thing is TPM is Trusted Platform but that's actually built into the motherboards as far as an encryption standard. Um, but those are just some enterprise things that you could actually do um, as far as um, on your machines um, in an enterprise, okay? Um, also, okay. So how to protect yourself against cybercrime, okay? So we have talked about the cybercrime, the cyber criminals and all this great stuff. So how do we protect ourselves, okay? First and foremost, keep your software and operating systems updated. That is key, okay? Your antivirus so software, the, your antivirus software is only good as its last update. So if you haven't updated it in a while, <laughs> it doesn't have the signatures for the viruses and the malware that might be attacking your system, so definitely update it. OK, um, if you're in an enterprise environment, you might have a specific day of the week during off peak time where you actually do your patches. But if you do patches, always test your patches before you push them out into a production environment, because, again, if you don't test it first, it might break something and then you have to revert. But um, always patch up your systems. Keep your software updated. 
Uh, use uh, antivirus software, keep it updated, of course. Um, strong passwords, again, that's your first line of defense is the complexity of the passwords that you use, okay? Again, they say at a minimum eight, I say 16 uh, because I'm just like that. Um, but definitely you wanna use strong passwords. Uh, never open attachments and spam emails. Okay, never open attachments. Never, 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 okay? Um, do not give out personal information unless you're sure it is secure, okay? Um, that personal information is golden to a hacker. They could use it, go on the dark web. A lot of times they sell this information back and forth, okay? Um, so try to keep it as secure as possible, all right? Uh, mobile device security. All right, let's touch on mobile device security a little bit. Um, again, we all have cell phones, we all have tablets, um, and a lot of the sensitive information is stored in them. We need to make sure that we keep that as um, protected as possible. And a lot of times that's through, I think they have encryption standards that you can actually use. Um, a couple, um, God, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, there are some products out there that you use with um, cell phones um, as far as wiping data. Say if your phone got lost or stolen or anything like that, you can actually activate it. I know Apple has it where you can actually uh, activate it where it will wipe the phone. Okay, um, So definitely you want to be aware of that um, as far as mobile device security. Uh, tips for mobile device security. Um, always keep your device up to date. Um, I know you get those, um, those, those updates and they want you to say, do it now, do it now. And you're like, man, I'm not trying to do this right now. <laughs> but find the time. If it's off, you know, say it in the middle of the night when you go to sleep, just let it do its update. Okay? All right, that's a great time to do it. Um, always have some kind of antivirus or anti-malware on your mobile device. Okay? Don't just think that out of the box it's just going to have everything you need. It doesn't. Okay, you need to add a few uh, applications, and I'm, I don't know why I'm getting a blank. Usually I have, I know in the back of my mind, like, well, all this stuff is, but um, there's definitely a lot of products out there, like AVG, AVG Avast, um, other products out there that are really good. And a lot of it's free um, that you could actually use as, you know, they, they have a upgrade or a paid version, but sometimes you can get away with the free version and be okay. OK, um, but from an enterprise standpoint, you'll see um, there's a lot of um, I know Kaspersky used to be a big one um, as far as where they'll um, do a license for like all the machines within uh, your uh, environment. So but definitely put something on there. OK, uh, never leave your laptop or mobile device un unattended. Um, it only takes a few minutes if if the person knows what they're doing. OK. Um, another thing, if you find a flash drive in the parking lot, leave it there. Don't pick it up. Don't put it in nothing to try to figure out what's on it because as soon as you plug it in, you're got. They do that. They just leave them in the parking lot of businesses and hopefully somebody will pick it up. But anyway, uh, that's a one-off. Um, back up your data frequently, okay? Always back up your data. Um, I think that's one thing that I stress to my students is like, if you want to keep a job and have a job, make sure you do your backups. <laughs> because if everything goes down, they're going to come looking at you. <laughs> I don't care if you got a cloud backup, you can have physical backup, whichever way you want to back it up, make sure you back it up. Okay. Um, ensure access to your mobile device is protected by a passcode. I think we all have some kind of passcode, whether it be fingerprint or a pattern or numbers or a pen. Okay, make sure you do that with your device. All right, um, consider using a remote tracking or wipe function. Again, iCloud has that function for free, a functionality. Um, you can add that on Android devices as well. Okay, um, so definitely um, consider that specific option. Okay. All right, reminders, be careful about email attachment, web links, those type of things. Uh, do not click on a link or an attachment if you're not expecting to get one, 
okay? Uh, use separate personal and business computers, mobile devices, and, uh, and accounts, okay? Um, my laptop, I have one that's personal, personal. I have one that I work specifically for USM, okay? And I keep those separate, okay? Keep your, your personal and your work separate, okay? Uh, use multi-factor authentication when offered. It is the biggest headache on the planet Earth, but it is necessary, okay? I know with USM, every time I log into my email account at work, I have to go to the Microsoft Authenticator, get a code from them, and then put it back in <laughs> to do it. It's a headache, but it's a necessary headache, especially with the way that the world is as far as um, cybercrime is concerned, cyber threats. It's just a headache that we have to endure and, and deal with, okay? All right, do not download software from an unknown web page, okay? Do not do that. Um, if you don't, if you can't um, authenticate it, um, don't use it, okay? Uh, never give out your username and password. Some of this stuff is really common sense, but sense ain't always common, <laughs> okay? Uh, so don't give out your username and password. Um, Another thing is consider a password management application, okay? Because again, we use so many passwords on so many different things as far as banking apps, uh, our Google accounts, all kinds of things. So instead of going to the well over and over again with the same password, use password management software and you can kind of build a little bit more complexity uh, as far as the passwords that you use, okay? Yeah, LastPass is a good one. Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of students use that one. Yeah. All right. Any questions? I didn't burnt your eardrums for a whole, how long? Oh, Lord, I did two hours. Bless it. Bless it all. <laughs> I'm proud of me. Uh, any questions um, about it? Any, got some comments y'all want to say? Concerns? Anything like that? No? Everybody quiet? All right, well, thank you guys so much for your time.